Phillips, who's the author, and he is the apologetic minister of the Missouri Baptist Convention. And the title of our book <clears throat> is What Every Christian Should Know About Satan. Tonight we're going to be looking at the title of Satan as Deceiver. And we'll see where a lot of these names overlap because they're talking about the evil one. Uh, has anyone ever uh, heard a film by the name of The Great Imposter? Uh, anyway, it's about uh, during World War II, we see that uh, this man borrowed a buddy's uh, uniform. Uh, we see that uh, he didn't like it, so he went AWOL and he faked his own suicide. And they found out that uh, he really wasn't in the Army to begin with. Uh, then we see that uh, another time he masqueraded as a surgeon aboard a Canadian Navy destroyer. And there he successfully completed a string of major sur surgeries before he discovered that he was no more qualified than to gut a fish. <laughs> uh, he, he got drummed out of the military, but undeterred, we're told, they moved on to other mock roles, and his final gig was a Baptist minister. <laughs> so we, we see people who are imposters or deceivers, and uh, we're uh, to be on our guard against those who disguise themselves as servants of righteousness and infiltrate the church. In fact, Paul warns us of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But even more important, we're to be ever, uh, vigilant concerning the greatest imposter of all, which is Satan. And uh, we're going to look at that title for him this evening. There's no sense in which society regards deceivers as positive. There's just no spin you can put on the name deceiver. Uh, and some of the synonyms, synonyms uh, for deceiver are fraud, imposter, charlatan, Double dealer, faker, counterfeit, bluffer, hypocrite, sham, fabricator, liar. So, you know, if I say, yeah, that, you know, uh, Dennis, boy, he's a double dealer. You know, they, they're not going to think, yeah, well, that's neat. You know, that's really cool. Uh, nothing positive about it. In fact, the name deceiver always are negative statements, and they don't commit isolated acts of deception, they do it uh, continually. Now let me give you an example of this, is that is uh, Abraham on two different occasions, he told two different kings that his wife was his sister. Now it really wasn't a lie because she was his half sister, but he was still using it to deceive the kings because he thought if they know she's my wife, they'll kill her in order to have her. And so he lied about it. But when we look at the entire story of Abraham's life, we see that he didn't deceive continually. He did it on two occasions that we know. Of. And so we wouldn't call him uh, really a deceiver because his character was greater than that as we look at it. But what about the, the creature? Uh, scriptures describe as, uh, you know, deceivers. Uh, who do deception on occasional work that Satan employs them. Uh, we know that Satan, by his very nature, is a deceiver, but he's so cunning that he is able to entice people to sin, even while making them think that what they're doing is something good. Uh, think of people who are being deceived who, you know, that they're being scammed out of their life savings, you know. I heard about somebody who was taking up offerings for uh, over in the, uh, Ukraine, and they were calling people up, and a lot of the older people have given you know, thousands of dollars because they were deceived, thinking they were given to a good organization, and, and people were being fraudulent with them and, and took them, uh, you know, pleased them, if you would. Uh, the words deceive, deceive, deception, and deceiver appear dozens of times in scriptures and refer to many different individuals, but not surprisingly, Satan is the first and last deceiver in the Bible. First time is in Genesis chapter 3, where we sing with Eve, and the last time is uh, in the book of Revelation, where the devil deceived the nations and is thrown into the lake of fire uh, in 
Revelation chapter 20. Now here are some examples of deception in the Bible. Genesis 27, 12. Rebekah partners with her son Jacob to trick Isaac in order to get Esau's blessing. Remember, she put hair on his arms, you know, sheep hair, and had him put on some of Esau's clothes and uh, made up cheap. He killed a sheep and his mother cooked it so it tastes like the wild game that Esau was uh, favorable towards. And he gave him his blessing because he was blind and he couldn't see. And when Esau come in, he says, well, what is left? I've already given everything to your brother. We see in Genesis 29, Laban sends Leah rather than Rachel to yeah. Jacob's honeymoon suite. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after a five-day wedding, you know, you're probably pretty inebriated. <laughs> and, uh, he didn't know the difference until the next morning when he had lights on. And he could see that she was not... Uh, the one he thought he was giving, and so he ended up having to work 20 more years in order to get Rachel, but she was given to him the next day, but he still had to work 20 years for her. In Joshua 7 11, God accused the Israelites of deceiving him, or at least trying to deceive him, and because of that, they had a defeat in the uh, town of Ai, Ai. Joshua 9, 3 through 15, the Gibeonites deceived Joshua into making a treaty with them. Now God told them, don't make any trees. And they put on dirty clothes and they had moldy bread and make it look like they had come a long way that they really weren't in the promised land and says, you know, make a treaty with us. So if you ever come to our territory, you know, you won't, you know, fight against us. Without asking God, we see here that Joshua did make a treaty with them and God said to him, why do you asked me before you did it. Uh, but they were forced not to kill them. And so we're told from that day on, they became slaves and servants of the Israelites. Uh, 1 Samuel 28, King Saul disguised himself in order to go to the medium at the end door because he wanted to talk to the uh, departed spirit of Samuel. Uh, Ezekiel 14, the Lord gets into the act, but in a very different way, he deceives a false prophet. Uh, in order to expose him and to punish him. Uh, we all know the story of the donkey and all the other things that Balaam, you know, had done to him. In Matthew 24, we see God warns against the false prophets and false teachers. Matthew 27, the religious leader falsely accused Jesus of being a deceiver. In fact, that claiming that his miracles were done by the power of Beelzebub. Romans 16, 18, divisive people in the church of Rome use smooth talk and flattering words to deceive the followers of Jesus, saying that they had to keep the law. 1 Corinthians 3, 18, Paul warns the Corinthians against falling into deception, including self-deception. Ephesians 4, mature believers are no longer tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, but by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. Ephesians 5, 6, false teachers use empty but persuasive arguments to deceive Christians. And then finally, Revelation 19, 20, the false prophets of the last day deceives many people. But in the end, deceived and deceiver, the Bible says, belong to God. <clears throat> Job 12, 16. Uh, Satan's finest work was, and we've already been over this many times, is when he deceived Eden in the Garden of Eden and caused the death of everyone. We were meant to live for eternity, but uh, through charming her into believing, you know, uh, his words rather than God's, he called the fall of mankind. And uh, we talked about how they died immediately spiritually, they began to die in their soul, and then ultimately they died physically. <clears throat> now, the verb deceive has many variant forms, and we're going to look at a few of them. Uh, but one means to trifle with or to mock, to entertain false hopes or to betray. Uh, Eve complained to God after she was deceived, well, the devil, you know, he, he was, I'm sorry, the, the snake, you know, he deceived me. Uh, we see that uh, citing the tragic event, Paul reminds Timothy when he's talking about Eve, he said that Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived 
and transgress, 1 Timothy 2.14. Other Greek words are applied in the New Testament. Uh, for example, there's a word deceit, Jesus, Paul, and Peter all include these amongst the vices. Uh, Peter makes it clear that Jesus was free of any deceitfulness. That is, he could not lie, and therefore he could not deceive. Uh, the verb denotes mocking or making sport of, and it's used only in the Gospels, but the meaning of being tricked. For example, the Magi succeeded in getting away from Herod. Uh, remember, the Holy Spirit warned them, and they went a different way. Uh, other than the way he told them to come back and see him, and they didn't. So, you know, a lot of these different words, you know, talk about uh, to be betrayed or to trifle with. Now, in the deceiver's uh, quiver, he has many uh, different ways of leading people astray. Uh, the idea behind the term is to entice someone to wander. Uh, I'm not, I can't think of the name right now. Uh, anyway, there's this author who wrote a book, and in it he says that, that God allows uh, Satan to sometimes either to burn people out or to have them just sit and rust out. And the reason for this is because Satan doesn't care what he has to do as long as he gets people out. And that's his whole, whole way of looking at things. As long as a Christian is not living the Christian life, it's a success. So people who rust out are people who sit in warm pew and don't do anything. People who burn out, they're trying to do everything because they say, well, there's not enough people doing what they need to do, and so they take on more than they're able to do, and it makes them angry, and they either quit or leave the church or go somewhere else. And so either way, Satan is the winner when these things happen. And we got to make sure that you know we are all pulling our weight so that no one uh, feels either way. A uh, man by the name of Peter Bolt writes, the title Deceiver reflects Satan's endeavors to lead people away from the love and security of our holy God. And so his role as Deceiver is grounded in his character. Remember, we talked about this as a father of lies. Lies began with him, therefore he is the father and it's in his nature and his every tendency is to distort the truth so that people made as God's image bearers really miss the very purpose for which God has created us. Now, how does he do that? Well, here are some ways. I think there's eight of them. Number, well, number one is the well-placed question. And we saw this in the Garden of Eden. Remember, he challenges him, did God say you shouldn't eat of any tree, of the fruit in the garden? And so he puts it to the extremes. You know, did God really? And she said, no, no. And so she corrects him. She says, God said we may eat of every tree except for the one, and we must not even touch it. And remember, because she added to what God had actually said, Satan said to her, you will not die. That is implying you will not die if you touch the fruit fruit, it's only if you eat it. And so it got into her mind that what did God really say? You know, had she misunderstood everything, you know, was she missing out on something? And it got her to think that uh, maybe Adam and Eve, uh, God was trying to keep them from enjoying things that should have been uh, open to them. Now we see these well-placed questions even today. Uh, such as, doesn't God just want me to be happy? You know, I've heard that on several occasions. You know, uh, one lady said to me, she said, uh, she said, well, I have to get a divorce because I'm just not happy. And I said to her, I said, the Bible doesn't teach that. She said, well, I know God wants me to be happy and I'm just not happy in this marriage. I said, you know, does God want me miserable? Maybe. <laughs> you know? But I know he doesn't want you to divorce other than for a fact of adultery. Uh, but people think that God just wants me to be happy. Or, here's another one, is Jesus really the only way to eternal life? How many different preachers have you heard say there are many ways to God? You know, many ways to Rome, many ways to God. You know, so... 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. And so it's a very resti restrictive uh, Christianity is uh, religion. Uh, or they may say, uh, how can my desire to be wrong since God made me this way? You know, this is probably talking about someone maybe homosexual or whatever. No, if God made me this way, then it can't be wrong. And we're hearing these kind of things a lot later, lately. Hasn't society advanced beyond outdated biblical commands? I remember talking to a young lady one time, and she says, well, well that's, that was written 2,000 years ago. We know a lot more now than what they knew then. You know, like the Bible's outdated. You hear that a lot. Yeah. Like Practical, practically, all our modern philosophy is built on, uh, you know, that's that Stone Age stuff, the Bible. You know. yeah. We we revile past that, you know. And I've heard this one lately. Uh, why shouldn't I live my truth? Let other people live their truth, as if there's more than one truth. You know, there's truth and there's lies. That's all. And God's word is true. Often the very first step to wandering away from God is to question his word. Now, Jared Wilson, you may have heard of him. He said, the trap is subtle. What Satan continues to do today is what he originally did in the garden, substituting a vision of rival facts in place of the real thing. Every sinful decision you and I make begins with the Satanic question, did God really say? Number two is the outright lie. Jesus made clear that Satan does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44. You know, after the well-placed question to Eve, we see that the serpent slithers uh, his bare-faced lie, no, you will not die. Now, he could have been making that reference to touching it, but still he's saying that God, God's not going to kill you if you even if you eat it. Uh, and so we know that he will just flat out lie to us. Now when told forcefully and often enough a lie, it may become an acquainted truth. And here are some things we hear today also. An unborn child is just an expendable blob of tissue. The aged and infirm become uh, pitiable objects and need euthanizing in the name of quality of life. Gender becomes fluid. The covenant of marriage becomes an open-end agreement. And sexual immorality becomes a liberating right that all enlightened people must celebrate. Now notice how it works. The outright lie first shocks us. But over time we become desynthetize, and finally we accept the lie. The evil one wields blunt force lies to wear us down. And we see that, saw this really in the whole, uh, you know, uh, L, B, Q, N, O, P, you know, uh, lies, because it started out, you know, years before, uh, they actually uh, gave marriage to them, and saying that, you know, well, you know, that's outdated. Why, who cares what people do in their own homes, you know, and all these other things. And they build it up. And finally, they make heroes out of something that the Bible says is, you know, uh, degenerating. And uh, before long, to the people without faith, it becomes, it starts sounding, yeah, it's not too bad. And we find that even Christians, uh, Thank goodness not Southern Baptists, but the other denominations begin to think, well, what is wrong with that? That's out, you know, it's, it's, things have changed and, and we need to love our, our neighbor and, uh, you know, so let's be accepting of them. And that's why it's come down today. And so the lie has become the truth and the truth has become the lie. Paul talks about this in, I believe it's 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy 3 where he says in the last days, right will be wrong and wrong will be right. And that's where we're at today. Now then, there's the blinded mind. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 we read, But if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is an image of God. So in the uh, uh, parable of the sower, Jesus gives us an example of this, where he says, like birds swoop down to pluck seeds from the pathway, Satan snatches the word of God from unbelievers' hearts before it can take root. And so he wants to leave them blind. He wants to keep their minds uh, where they can't see the truth. John Piper says, Satan not only speaks what is false, he hides what is true. He keeps us from seeing the treasure of the gospel. He lets us see facts, even proofs, but not the preciousness of it. Now, while the evil one keeps unbelievers in the dark, he also strives to obscure our thinking, that is, as Christians. And that is, so we fail to be effective witnesses for Christ. For example, Paul in his letters to the Galatians shows how Satan uses false teachers in the church to enslave uh, the people from having a uh, form of uh, counterfeit and offers to them a counterfeit workspace solution. This is what Paul says to him, and he says to him, who has deceived you, you know, who has blinded your eyes that you don't see the truth? When they, I gave the truth, I went away, and now these teachers are coming behind me, and they're telling you you've got to work your way instead of putting your simple faith in Jesus, Savior and Lord. And that's the blinded way that Satan tries to get even Christians from seeing and being good witnesses. Number four is the masquerade. Writing to the Corinthians again, Paul uh, <clears throat> told him to say, oh, Paul must embrace the foolishness of defending his uh, apostleship to them. Now, Paul, think about this for a minute. Paul, the greatest apostle that ever lived. You know, he probably next to Jesus Christ was one of the smartest men uh, in the New Testament. He wrote 13 of the 26 uh, books of the New Testament. And, and yet, they says that, well, you're, you're not as good as these super apostles that came to Corinth. And uh, they got so much going for them. And uh, you really don't have a lot going for yourself, Paul. <laughs> you know, remember Paul talks about, he said, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with, you know, eloquent words. Uh, he said, I came to you with a plain gospel message. But, you know, these people come and, you know, evidently they look good. Paul had a disease of the eyes, we know, according to the book of Galatians, and that may have been malaria or something. He even tells them, you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if, if it were possible. Uh, and so we're not sure if that's really the thorn in the flesh he talks about later or not, but we know he did have this eye disease. We know that... Uh, according to some of the uh, people who had heard Paul, some of the first, uh, I, I forget what they call them, uh, people who lived after the apostles, but anyway, like Origen and, and some of the early uh, people, they said that Paul talked in a high-pitched, monotone voice. You know, so he wasn't a good preacher, he wasn't good to look at. <laughs> You know, he, he had a disease of his eyes. He must have been a sight to behold. And here comes these good-looking, smooth-talking, uh, you know, people. And, and they're saying, now, Paul, he was okay, but he didn't take it far enough. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law. You've got to become a Jew first. Once you become a Jew, then you can be a Christian. But you have to continue to keep the law, and you have to continue to be circumcised. These are what is called Judaizers. And everywhere Paul came, they followed right behind him, trying to distort the truth of the gospel. We see that uh, Satan used lying signs and wonders too. Now Paul describes the last days with these words. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie and with every wicked deception among those who uh, are perishing, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Jesus also addressed this in Matthew 24, 
where he says, For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now, it's not possible to lead the elect away, but he says, you know, they're going to be that, have that much sway upon people that if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we, we would be led astray also. And at the final judgment, some of them believers protest. Okay. <laughs> At the final judgment, some believers who claim to be believers are really unbelievers protest Christ's sentence of hell and they say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? And Jesus responds, I never knew you depart from me, you lawbreakers, Matthew 7, 22 and 23. So, you know, there are those who may do signs and wonders and uh, there's two groups of thinking here there are those pentecostals mainly who believe that god is going to allow satan and his cohorts to do uh, real miracles but even they say if god allows it it's under his sovereignty that is he he allows satan to do this and satan's cohorts and there are others who say no they're not real miracles they are kind of like the miracles that the uh, magicians did <clears throat> in Pharaoh's court where Moses and Aaron did miracles and they, they could imitate the first two or three, but once it turned into really, you know, great things that God was doing, they couldn't imitate it. It's like these magicians today with sleight of hand can make an elephant disappear, you know. They're not really disappearing, they just put a big mirror up in front of them or what. <laughs> whatever, to deceive people to think that their eyes are lying to them. And so we see here that uh, whether, you know, his miracles are real and God allows it, they're not real miracles, really is beside the point. The purpose behind these lying signs and wonders is to lead people astray. The reason the Apostle John urges us not to believe every spirit, that is, every person who claims divine, divine gifting for service, whether rather we are to test the spirits to see if they are from God, 1 John 4.1. Uh, like the Bereans, they took everything Paul said and they went to search scripture. Is everything he's saying true? And that's the way we should be. We shouldn't just take anybody's, you know, you shouldn't take mine. You should, you know, take it and say, does it square up with the Bible? Is it really what the Word of God says? And those who confess biblical truths about the person and work of Christ uh, may be trusted, but those who deny the full deity and full humanity of Jesus, like the uh, Dotitians who claim that Jesus only appeared to be human, uh, are to be rejected. Number six, uh, Satan used enticement. Uh, we saw last week that Satan was the tempter and his most persuasive uh, uh, antagonist, he is not omniscient, and he's a highly uh, skillful in observation. He sees what we choose, what we like, what we know, and he likes to take those things and twist them and use them uh, to bring about his desired results. He proved more successful in the pursuit of Judas, his chariot, and uh, got him to actually betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that Paul worries a lot aloud for the Corinthians admitting, but I fear as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced uh, from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3. We see that sure enough, the local church Paul had planted Corinth just a few late years uh, earlier is now embracing false teaching about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the gospel. And so when he writes to him in 2 Corinthians, he's got to, you know, tell them those words that uh, they've been taught were wrong. James warns about how subtle and persuasive sin overtakes us. Notice he says God cannot be tempted to sin, and he never tempts us, but the evil one sows seeds in our thoughts and processes, and unless we immediately take those thoughts captive, we start down a slippery slope that ends in sin. In James 1, 14, 15, 
uh, is the words that he actually says. He is the accuser of the brethren. So he makes accusation. Again, in the first recorded encounter with human beings, we see that uh, the evil one accuses God of denying Adam and Eve what's rightfully theirs, because if God gave it to them, they would be like God, which is just an outright blatant lie. We see that Satan again in the book of Job alleges Job's loyalty to Yahweh hinges on safety that God had built around him. God allows Satan to take away his safety. He loses all his riches, all his uh, land, all his uh, animals, and uh, even his own children. Now, this, he comes the next day, and the Lord says, yeah, you see, you didn't curse me at all. You're, you're wrong. He said, oh, let me touch his flesh. And so God says, okay, but just don't take his life. And we see that Job, you know, we have this long, now the rest of, from chapter 3 on to chapter 45, where uh, Job's pleading his case, his accusers come to him, tell him to curse God and die. And Job hangs on to his integrity, so we see that at the very end of it, God gives back to him ten children, uh, seven sons and three daughters, just what he had before, and doubles the riches and animals and everything that he had uh, prior to that. Another way that uh, Satan accuses, it appears in Zechariah 3, where the high priest Joshua came back from exile, and he had not been the chief priest he was should have been, and so Satan accuses him before God and says, you know, look at him, he's dirty. And symbolically, his turban and his clothes were dirty to show that he was sinful. <clears throat> and uh, this time, the angel of the Lord uh, stands in front of him and says, uh, you know, he, you know, you're you're accusing him falsely, and uh, he belongs to God, and so. God says, give him a clean set of linen clothes and a new turban uh, to show that God had cleansed his heart and his mind uh, because he was going to now be the leader that God had meant for him to be. So Satan comes accusing all the time. The last one is that he uses institutional leverage. Right? Yeah, that's the last one. We see that Satan leads the word world astray through false religions as well as cultural, political, and economic institutions. For example, the major world religions like Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all have a high regard for Jesus Christ. They all write about him in their, in their writings. They all speak highly of him. But none of them give him uh, what he really is. They don't elevate him to being you know, God in the flesh. They, they say he was a human being, he taught many good things, um, and we, we think he might have even been a prophet, but uh, no way do we believe he is God in the flesh. And not only the foreign religions, but also we've got religions like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, or the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, we see uh, in the Mormons, they uh, say that Jesus is the first eternally existing intelligence to be born into the present uh, spirit realm via sex sexual relations between Elohim, that is God, and the Heavenly Mother. And after taking on flesh and a mortal uh, probation, Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead to reclaim the immortality and that Adam had lost in the garden, thus making it possible for all humans to attain divinity. So they also go on to say that every man is going to be a god over his own rule, own world. You know, there are billions of worlds out there. What are they for? And so Mormons say it's because God's going to give a world to every male. And then the male gets to decide whether his wife gets to rise from the dead or not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's going to be a god of his own world. So some of you may want to change the Mormonism. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's, you know. But what they're saying is Jesus was created. 
No, he was not eternally God. And then under Jehovah Witness, they grant Jesus a status of mighty God, a created archangel who later is refashioned as Jesus, the man. Then after dying on a first century torture stake to pay for Adam's sin, but not for ours, just for Adam, he is spiritually reborn as an exalted archangel. So he never gets the place of God in Jehovah's Witnesses either. He's an archangel. So, you know, while we don't question the sincerity of these people, I've talked to several of them. They come knock on my door, you know, and I, I like to sit and talk to them for a while. <laughs> you know, and uh, just to you know, discuss some of their beliefs, and many of them are very sincere. I mean, they really believe what they're selling. Uh, but it's not biblical, and like the Jehovah's Witness, they made their own Bible, and they changed the words, such as in John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and they make it say, and he was a God, not the God. And so they changed, they got their own Bible, so they can change all the theology around and make it fit what they believe. They don't hold to, you know, the manuscripts uh, that we have. And so not only do we have cults, we've also got these other religions that hold Jesus up, but they don't give him the rightful uh, place that he so richly deserves. Now, talking about the deceiver, we'll look at now just in the New Testament, we see he's a consummate a schemer, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. It says, anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armor of God so that you'll stand against the schemes of the devil. So each of these passages, Paul's pointing out the evil one's schemes. First, schemes on believers. Uh, we're to educate ourselves about Satan's plot so we don't fall into them and uh, take advantage over us. But schemes, as in 2 Corinthians 2.11, uh, means thoughts, purposes, or designs. And so these are schemes intended to cause harm. So whenever Satan schemes, he never means it for good. He just means it to cause harm. Second, we are to wear God's protective armor. And this is Ephesians chapter 6. And we see that it's, so we'll be able to stand up under the face of Satan's attacks upon us, whether it's either Satan or his cohorts that come against us and try to get us to sin. We see here that uh, in Ephesians 6, 11, the word schemes mean methods. So we need to be mindful of the methods that the evil one hatches and plans and the strategy that he brings to try and bring us down. Now in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul in his first uh, epistle was writing about the man who was living with his stepmother. And he says, and they were proud of it. That's the thing that really set, set Paul off, that they were proud, they were progressive. You know, that's the word for today. <laughs> and they thought, wow, you know, we're, we're liberal-minded. We're going to allow this. In fact, let's encourage it. Let's have more and more people, you know, doing these type of things. So Paul says, hey, I'm not there with you, but I've already judged this man. And I'm telling you right now, you judge him or I'm going to come and judge you. You, you do church discipline. You put him out in your midst. And... Uh, if you do the right thing when I come, I won't have to be, you know, deal with you and, you know, cause difficult harm to come upon you. Well, between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, the people had done what Paul said. They put him out of, out of the church. Now Paul says to them, okay, you've done what I told you, that's good, but now he's repented and he's moved out. He's no longer living with his, his stepmother. He's, he's recognized the wrong that he had done. Now you're to forgive him and restore him, lest you give Satan an advantage over him. Now, I know you all read my blogs. It's on our website. 
But I wrote a blog this week on judging. And so you may want to read it because I talk about some of this on it. But anyway, we see here that uh, what he's talking here is that we need to have balance in church discipline. I wish I'd put a reminder in the bulletin about that because I know you got a blog, but I, I don't remember to read it. And if there was something in the bulletin, a reminder every week then. Yeah. Well, Randy and I have Sunday school class. Oh. It's on there every week. And Wednesday night, what we're doing right here is yeah. on there too. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, sure. we uh, see that the church was reluctant to forgive him. But as we've got to understand, the only reason you do church discipline is because you want the person who's caught in an outward blatant sin to repent and be restored. Restoration is the whole thing. Not to let a believer stay in a sin. Not to let him, you know, continue into living a sinful life, but to help get him to repent, and he gets out of sin, and then we're to restore him and act like it never happened. Uh, but too many people, for the wrong reason, like judging other people, because I guess it makes them feel superior. And the Bible says, no, the whole point of pointing out someone's sin is to restore them back to the faith. I even talk a little bit about those who like to do fruit inspectors. So you may want to read that blog. Second of, we see that uh, we are to wear God's protective armor, as we already mentioned about, and that is so that we can stand up and uh, be able to, you know, do war, if, it, if you will, with, with Satan and with sin. Now, Paul stresses the necessity of spiritual armor, which is truth, righteousness, readiness with the gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God in which we take our stand in the struggle against Satan and, the arm, and his armies, verses 11 through 17. Now, until then, we're to remember that Paul is under no uh, delusion about the Christian life. It is an ongoing battle. And too often we, we forget about that and we settle down in this world and become very comfortable. Uh, but the Bible teaches us that we're to live as aliens. Uh, John MacArthur says we're to live as though we're living in enemy territory. And I think of good about, you know, the Ukrainians. Now Russia's taking over their whole thing, and, you know, they're going to be fighting against them. No matter what puppet, you know, Putin puts up there, they're going to, you know, like the French uh, army, you know, did during World War II, even though they're living underneath uh, the dominion of the enemy, they're going to still be fighting against them. Well, that's what we as Christians are supposed to be doing, that we don't get too comfortable in this life. Now, we are to live a victorious life. This life is given to us to enjoy in Christ Jesus, and so it doesn't mean we're not to enjoy the good things of life, like family and children and, you know, uh, all the different things that, you know, as we go through our life, but we're not to be so settled that we start to forget about God and allow the things of the world to become more important than the things of God. And it's real easy to do. I mean, for anybody, you know, just to, uh, I'm tired of the battle. You know, after 40, 50 years, you get tired. You, you know, you think, well, you know, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. But uh, there is no retirement in God's army. You know, there is no way that we ever stop fighting the battle, no way we ever stop uh, straining. And, and as Paul said, I strive towards the, the high, call, high calling of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the thing we do all of our lives until we quit breathing. We see that uh, Satan is a cunning seducer. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. He said, but I fear that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a sincere or pure devotion to Christ. Excuse me. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit, which you had not received from us, 
our different gospel, which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. And so Paul is saying, you know, don't be seduced. And we, you know, especially young Christians can be easily seduced. I remember that there's a woman who, you know, came to her church and uh, getting involved and uh, doing fairly well as a young Christian. Well, what I didn't know is that she had a friend who was a Jehovah's Witness and she was coming over daily giving her lessons. You know, and, and after a few months of getting lessons from her, she was all confused. And she said, well, I, I don't understand. You know, you say one thing, my friend says another. And I told her, I said, well, don't believe her or me. Read the Bible, you know. Don't listen to either one of us. Read the Bible for yourself and see what the Bible says. And then you'll know when somebody tells you something whether it's true or not. Because Satan likes to seduce people like that. And Paul even makes uh, mention of that, uh, that we don't allow ourselves to be uh, seduced. We see uh, the image of salvation is like a bridegroom between Christ and his bride, uh, like a first century marriage, if you will, involving two separate ceremonies, the betrothal and the nuptial. And we saw, saw this with uh, Mary and Joseph. Remember that Joseph was going to give her a writ of divorce. Well, they weren't married, they were just betrothed. But yet, he was going to do what the Jewish law at the time required because a betrothal was just as legal as the marriage itself. And he thought she had been unfaithful to her, he could have had her stoned to death, but he decided to put her away privately. And, you know, because he loved her. Well, then the angel told him, he said, hey, this, this is of God. You know, she didn't do anything wrong. You know, don't worry about it. Go ahead and take her to be your bride. And so we see here that uh, we as uh, Christians, uh, Paul is talking to us about the church uh, as a second Eve. As Adam and Eve became one flesh, Christ and the church are joined in a covenant relationship. And we need to understand that. You know, Jesus looks at the church as his bride and he wants us to be faithful to him. He wants us to, uh, and this is what, uh, is it Thessalonians? I think it's chapter four, where it talks about a man should love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Uh, this is the way it is. Jesus died for the church, it says in one place. You know, and if he loved the church enough to die for her, then a man should love his wife enough to die for her if necessary. And so we see these implications between marriage and the church itself. And so God is very protective of his church. But he also is protective of the church's faithfulness back to him. And this is why it's important uh, when he's writing to the Corinthian believers that they welcome seducers into the church. Uh, these super apostles who are teaching another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. Uh, he was allowing harlotry to come, or the Corinthians were allowing harlotry to come into their church and really uh, doing great harm to it. Paul worries that the church of Corinth, Christ's betrothed uh, bride, is falling prey to Satan's deception. As the serpent enticed Eve to disobey God, the super apostles of Corinth, the God Christian, uh, followers to embrace counterfeit doctrines. And that's why we have so many people today who get into uh, some of these like Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism and the others because they're beguiled. And, uh, you know, they really don't know enough about the Bible to keep, you know, from falling into false doctrine. We see that Satan is a master of disguise, 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15. For such people are false apostles, deceiver, deceitful workers, uh, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. 
their end will be according to their works, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. So he goes on talking about these super apostles, you know, teaching another Christ, another spirit, a different gospel. And how awful it is for a church to be deceived. And yet, all these united church, whether it's United Church of Christ, United Methodist, United, United means that they've given up doctrine. In order to unite, they decide it's not important what we believe as long as we get along. And so any religion that has unite in its name is liberal. They, they've listened to the seducing spirits and, and now they said doctrine's not important because God's a God of love and we just need to love everybody. And so this is why the homosexuality is not looked down. In fact, they began to ordain lesbians and homosexuals to be priests and ministers in their churches and all these other things. They've listened to a master of disguise, and uh, they fall and pray to him. Now, <clears throat> Paul's reference to Satan disguising himself as an angel of light perhaps draws more than the uh, from a popular Jewish tradition than from Scripture. Although the serpent who appears to Eve in Genesis 3 may be a dazzling heavenly being, uh, as we have already talked about, he may have came down as a seraphim, uh, but we see here in the Jewish apocryphal life of Adam and Eve, Satan transforms himself into the brightness of angels and pretends to grieve with Eve who sits weeping by the Tigris River. In the apocryph apocrypha of Moses, never heard of it, Eve recalls, recalls her seduction. Satan appeared in the form of an angel and sang hymns like an angel. And I bent over the wall and saw him like an angel uh, of light. The whole point is that Satan can come to us as a, in many masquerades, in many different forms. You know, he comes to allure us, to attract us, seduce us, to glamorize us. He approaches with beauty and flattery. He offers special knowledge. And you heard people say, you know, especially the book of Revelation, well, it's, it's a secret book. You've got to know the keys. You've got to know, you know, the different numbers and the different things that go along with it to understand it. Instead of what Jesus says is, you're blessed if you read the book. You know, just for reading it, a blessing comes upon you. Uh, but there are those who talk about, you know, the Bible has secret numbers and secret messages and, you know, all these other things. Notice the Corinthian believers wanted to become rich and reign like kings, 1 Corinthians 4, 8. Sounds like the health and wealth gospel today. You know, never sick, you know, always healthy. Uh, but it's not taught in the Bible. But this is the way that Satan can seduce people. And notice Satan's attacks are seldom frontal. And that is they don't really need to be because he's so successful uh, when he uses false apostles or false teachers who come in and destroy with flattery and false doctrines from the inside out. Uh, that's why Paul concludes with these verses with the assurance that the false teacher's end will be according to the works. Just as Corinthian believers stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ, resulting in varying degrees of rewards, the super apostles are to be summoned before the great white throne judgment and punished for their evil deeds. That was Dennis, if anybody remembers. Distract. Who was that? Dennis. Who was that again? That was Dennis. Dennis Brown. <laughs> <laughs> You want to Google it? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, and now the original usurper, First uh, Timothy chapter two, verses uh, twelve through fourteen. He says, "I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. Satan is a usurper by nature." He seizes authority, not rightfully his, and so when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, Adam's authority, God had given him over the world, uh, we see the usurper took it, and that's why he claims he is the God of this world, even though it legitimately belongs to God still. We see 
what some people call it, uh, he holds it by proxy. And we see that means he's going to use it to attack God and God's people. We see this, for example, when he incites David to count the number of soldiers so David will rest in how many soldiers he has rather than God protecting him. He fills the hearts of Ananias and Sapphira to seek undue credit by saying they gave so much money rather than the actual amount that they gave. We see he takes control of Jesus, Judas Iscariot and actually enters into him to get him to uh, betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives the Antichrist his power, his throne, and his authority, we're told, in the last days. But the early example of uh, Satan as a usurper by proxy is when he attempted uh, Eve in the garden. And what we just read, Paul alludes to this tragic event as destruction to Timothy, urging the young pastor not to grant woman authority over men in the local church. This has been so misunderstood by so many people. It's good we take a minute here to really understand what he's saying here. The only thing he's saying is that a woman can't be a pastor. That's it. He's not saying she can't lead music. He's not saying she can't even pray publicly. Uh, we'll get through all this. The main, really the main thing he's saying, she can't have authority. And this is what it's all about, is authority over men. And so that's why only a man can be a pastor. Well, we've got, again, all these liberal churches having women pastors. And they're, again, saying, well, you know, we've got women's rights now, you know. They didn't get the vote till what, 1911 or something like that. And so, you know, we've really held women back. So, yeah, let them be pastors. Well, what Paul is saying here is really important. And we'll see the reason that he says this part. Paul is not prohibiting women from speaking or praying publicly in the church, for we see women like Phoebe, Priscilla, and the virgin daughters of Philip who had active parts in their churches and their communities. Now, this is not a question of being valuable either, for Paul is clear that all people, men and women alike, are equally guilty before God as sinners and equally welcome into the kingdom of God. Nor is this a matter of giftedness uh, for service, as if Paul has somehow endowed men with superior spiritual gifts, for Paul is clear that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to all, and all the gifts are essential to a healthy community of faith, and it's the Spirit who gives them as He wills. And finally, this is not an issue of favoritism, for God is no respecter of persons. As I said, Paul... For him, it's an issue of authority. And we see that God has reserved the role of pastor, elder, overseer, whatever term you want to use for men. And we could cite 1 Timothy 3, 1, or Titus 1, 5 through 9. But now Paul gives us two reasons why a woman cannot be a pastor. And number one is because the order of creation that is, Adam was created first, and Eve was created out of Adam. And secondly, the order of the fall, because it was not Adam who was deceived, and that's what Paul says here, but it was Eve who was deceived, and then led her husband astray uh, by getting him to take of the food too. So we should note that the chronicle order is not the sole factor, because Adam uh, animals were created before Adam, so it's not chronologically, you know, the only reason that uh, God pointed this out. Because God also pointed out that man is male and female, mankind. And so uh, Eve is intended as a companion to Adam, and their relationship is designed to be a complementary, not competing relationship. But here's the second reason. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed, 1 Timothy 2.14. So for reasons not really told to us by the Bible, Satan approaches Eve and not Adam. We're not told why. We can't really say one way or another why he came to Eve rather than Adam. All we can say is that probably because Eve was not acquainted with the rules that God had given to Adam, 
about not eating the forbidden fruit. And he knew that she was kind of fuzzy you know, and uh, that she thought that she shouldn't even touch it. For it, anyway, for these two reasons, that's why a woman should not be a pastor of the church, it's because Adam was created first and Eve came from Adam. And number two is because Eve was deceived and not Adam. We see the evil one successfully entices Eve to transgress, and Eve in turn convinces Adam to disobey God's commands, not to partake of the tree of the fruit of good and evil. And all this results in the fall, and in that come all the curses, which continues to poison God's good creation even to today. It shows, if you want a reason, that choices have consequences. And just as Adam's willful rebellion against God leads to disaster results for all humanity, Eve's deception is a precursor to the fall. So Satan deceives Eve, and by proxy, he overturns God's authority, uh, order of authority. Now Paul ends this whole section by uh, 1 Timothy with a curious message he said, but she will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. 1 Timothy 2.15. Rob says this is a difficult statement. <laughs> you know, that's putting it mildly. But looking at all the many different statements, what does this mean? <clears throat> he says that the most likely meaning is that rather than to demand authoritative positions in the church, women may find true fulfillment through childbearing. That is, in keeping with God's command before the fall to be fruitful and multiply. In both 1 Timothy 2 and Titus 2, Paul declares that wives have a God-ordained role to play in caring for the children in the home. Denny Burke, I don't know if you're familiar with him, says this is not claiming that a woman must have children in order to be saved. It's not even teaching that a woman must be married to be saved. But for those women who are married, God assigns, assigns a special responsibility to care for their home. Now I've always heard that what Paul was actually saying was that a woman would be saved, that is the pain of childbearing. That is, her pain will be as bad if she is a loving wife. You know, so there are many Same different views, well. many different ways to look at that. But what Rob is saying does make sense. Well, you know, instead of trying to find your you know, fulfillment in the church, find your fulfillment at home, take care of children. I heard, I mean, one thing I heard, you probably heard this too, is that the world is is saved through childbearing because that's how the Messiah eventually comes, right? Well, through the uh, Masonic line. Right, right. Like, and in other words, if, if, he, if we didn't have children, we just died off, there would be no Messiah, there would be no redemption. Yeah, so you, the world has to get, keep going, the world has to keep going until Christ returns too, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So in order to be saved, we gotta wait, we gotta, so, so, Society has to go on until. Yeah, it's a different type of salvation. It's not talking about spiritual salvation. It's talking about physical salvation. I think so. Mm -hmm. It can't be spiritual salvation. That would be ridiculous. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, but some people have interpreted it that way. Mm -hmm. So the we're just trying to write some wrong. Yeah. <laughs> also, we see that Satan is the chief of global enterprise. Remember. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil, and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him, Revelation 12, 9. And so we see the scope of Satan's work by the time Jesus comes again. Satan would have deceived the whole world. And depending on your view of how everything's going to happen at the end, there are those who believe the church will be taken out of the way. And so there will only be unbelievers left. And well, if that is true, a true understanding, then he will deceive the whole world because there will be nobody of faith and the Holy Spirit will be gone. Satan's role as chief executive of the sinister global enterprise uh, 
shows that the evil one deceives the whole world. But what does the apostle mean by that? He says the Greek word often translated world may be interpreted in a number of ways from the planet Earth to the world system under Satan's control. But here it's talking about the entire inhabited Earth. And he gives some illustrations of that. So John sees the great dragon as the one seeking to deceive the entire human race. William Barclay, who lived 100 years ago, says that Satan stands for the sleeping vigilance of evil against good. And so he's always trying to deceive, to lead astray. And he gives us four or five things. First of all, Satan stalks. Remember that Peter tells us like a roaring lion that he's walking around the earth to see who he may devour. We see he dilutes. Satan is the inspiration behind every spiritual thought that's in opposition to God. So anything that goes counter to what God wants, Satan is behind. We see he divides. The adversary persecutes Christ's sheep in an effort to scatter the flock. He goads prideful people to start their own forms of counterfeit Christianity or their own high exclusive sects. Now listen to these numbers. I, this is astounding. Did you know that there are 33,000 distinct Christian denominations in the world? <laughs> there, I'm told there's 49 different Southern, or not Southern Baptist, but Baptist types of churches. 49 different Baptists. Why? Because somebody says, well, when you uh, take the Lord's Supper, you ought to wash people's feet. And so they start a sect where they wash feet. Another first said, no, you don't wash people's feet. So they started their own a non feet washing. You know? So all these secondary issues that really shouldn't matter devise Christians and what it's doing is keeping us from really changing the world. You know, Jesus said if you love one another, that is if you keep together and if you have unity, we could change the world. And that's what happened in the first century. But we're so divided over secondary issues that really aren't important uh, that we can't even have fellowship with one another. Anyway, that 33,000 different denominations are in 233, 38 different countries. We see that Satan opposes. One of his uh, strategies is to lie about the church. Warren Worsby, you probably all heard of Warren. He deceives the nations into thinking that the people of God are dangerous, deluded, and even destructive. We're crazy. It's through Satan's deception that the leaders of the nations band together against Christ and his people. God's people in every age must expect the world's opposition, but the church can always defeat the enemy by being faithful to Christ. So he uses one tactic upon the other. He just doesn't come with one. You know, we looked at so many different things, stalks, deludes, divides, uh, opposes. And he doesn't just use one form. He, he lays one on top of the other, and he uses several at a time. If one doesn't work, maybe another will. And so we've got to be on our guard against uh, Satan. And we see that uh, when God did his experiment in the Old Testament with the Israelites, in which they joyfully declared their loyalty to the one true God, we will do all the Lord has spoken to us, Exodus 19:18. We see they fall into spiritual adultery. They go off and start worshiping idols uh, and not being true to God. And this is a counterfeit form of religion. It's counterfeit to what God wanted. And we've got counterfeit religions today uh, who claim to be Christian. As I said, every one of the United Churches you know, are a counterfeit form of Christian. They have a different gospel. They don't preach salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that God sends prophets to Israelites in the Old Testament to try and get them uh, to repent of their sins and, and listen to the true prophets. But we see that the false prophets form lying signs and wonders and lead the people away in Deuteronomy. They lull them to a false sense of security 
and they descend into deep and dangerous sin in the book of Jeremiah and on and on it goes. And then we see Jesus' New Testament writers consistently warn Christians about false teachers, false prophets, and false messiahs. Uh, we forget sometimes that they're going to be all through the church age until Jesus comes again. They're going to be false teachers, false prophets, and even those claiming to be messiahs. All this makes clear that the evil one has sold terrors in God's wheat field from the very beginning. And Satan's global enterprise in opposition to God's kingdom often looks the same, but they're entirely different. Just as tares resemble wheat as they grow together, but in the end, ultimately, the Lord Jesus will reap the harvest, gathering those who are his into barns and burning the tares into the fires of hell. Notice Satan's enterprise is indeed global, but it's a house of cards and it'll ultimately fall down. Okay, any question or comments about Satan uh, in this chapter? Next week we'll be looking at him as the evil one. <laughs> okay, if not, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for this evening, for loving us and blessing us. Just continue to watch over this church. Help us, dear God, to be faithful to you and to your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you.